Welcome to the Lunch and Learn. Welcome to the Lunch and Learn for October. Uh, before we get started, I want to tell everybody that we do have an in-house audience for the first time in a very long time. We're very happy to have that. Uh, we also got some folks out there in virtual land. Uh, when we're done, I'll ask questions from the studio audience first, and then we'll go out into cyberspace. Uh, next month, we have Dave Smoke McCluskey. He's a Mohawk. It's part of our Native American Studies Week. He'll be talking about indigenous science and the Free Sisters Diet, which is the corned bean squash trilogy. Uh, he's under the impression that they don't do that in the Southeast. We'll have to educate him to that. We'll get Becky to tell him what's going on. Um, and then in December, we have Hannah Bauer from the Commission for Minority Affairs. She's in the audience today. And she's gonna be talking about Native American mascots. And believe it or not, that is our 100th lunch and learn lecture. So special day for you. All right, today we're very pleased to have Brandon Jones. Brandon Jones is the Catawba Riverkeeper. Uh, in that job, he does a lot of things, everything from legislative liaison uh, to monitoring uh, uh, authorized pollution, point source pollution, coal ash, all the kinds of things that might affect the river. Uh, he's a graduate of UNC Chapel Hill. Uh, he's interested in environmental science pursuing a master's degree at UNC Charlotte uh, in environmental science. His specialty is hydrology uh, and particularly water chemistry. So uh, one of the things they do quite often is test the, test the waters. And so uh, Brian is an avid paddler. Phil Stokes will be impressed by that. Uh, and I'm impressed by the fact that he is a Frisbee disc golfer and goes out on the trails and throws the disc. So without further ado, uh, I give you Brandon Jones. Thank you for that kind introduction. Uh, they prefer the term disc golfer. Just, I don't care, but it is like a world championship this week. So just like a heads up. Uh, yeah, thank you all for having me. Uh, this is also my, I think, second in-person uh, presentation. I'm like, oh my gosh, like two years now it feels like. Uh, so it's really good to have an audience and potentially some even audience feedback. That would be a, something new and different and wonderful. Um, so today I'm here to talk to you a little bit about the Catawba Wari River Basin. Um, so it's a pretty large basin, I'll kind of go over that. But I'm going to talk about kind of what our organization does, what we recognize as um, some of the bigger challenges in the river, and then talk a little bit about how we came to that conclusion uh, through some of our monitoring and, and some of our metrics. Uh, so the uh, Riverkeeper Foundation, we're a 501c3 nonprofit. Uh, but kind of our mission here is to educate and advocate for the Catawba Wari Water River Basin. Um, there are roughly 350 or so um, other Riverkeeper Waterkeeper Alliance groups. So this all kind of started out the, the Hudson Bay Alliance uh, with this foundation of the Clean Water Act. Uh, but there's a Yadkin River Keeper and a Broad River Keeper and a French Broad River Keeper and a Winya Bay Keeper. And there's about 14 of us in North Carolina and about six of us in South Carolina. Um, so we're all divided up by those watersheds. Uh, we are primarily funded by memberships. Uh, so we've got uh, about 6,000 individual memberships now. Um, we also seek out grants um, and corporate partnerships. And we have a staff of, of nine right now. And that swells during the summer with a large intern group. So what do we actually do? Uh, we do a lot of different things. Everybody on our staff, like most nonprofits, wears about 15 different hats. So on any given day, uh, on the good days, I'm out there actually on the boat taking water samples. Unless it's January, then those days are a little bit less fun, but it's still better than being in the office behind the computer screen, um, where I spend probably most of my time analyzing the hundreds of pages of reports that are generated by uh, the government and other organizations each month. Um, we also do a lot of cleanups. We had our biggest cleanup last week with River Sweep. Uh, we pulled out about 53,000 pounds of trash across 55 sites. Uh, over 1,700 people volunteered their time. I uh, so appreciate everybody that participated in that. Uh, we're probably best known for our litigation. Um, there's a citizen suit provision in the Clean Water Act that allows our organization and individuals uh, to sue polluters. And so we kind of got our probably best known for our eight year uh, litigation against Duke Energy for coal ash on Mountain Island Lake, Lake Norman and Lake Wiley. Um, we also provide a lot of education. So not just to adults like this, uh, but we have a, a, a K through 12 program where we go out in the schools and we're hoping uh, starting here uh, next March uh, to actually to have students in Chester and uh, Atlantis County come out to our new uh, facility, uh, the Top River Outdoor Classroom. I'm 
currently calling it the Croc. We'll see if that sticks uh, next uh, March uh, over there by the Catawba Fish Camp. Um, of course, we encourage uh, individuals, companies, and um, uh, the different counties to enforce the regulations already in place. And then we have a what we call water watcher program where we uh, train individuals how to best protect their own water in the backyard. So we are, like I said, uh, kind of confined. Our jurisdiction is the Catawba water, water River Basin. So if you guys don't remember from like, you know, I guess it's eighth or fifth grade around here, um, whenever they talk to you about river basins, uh, when we say a basin or a watershed, I'll use those terms interchangeably, it's just an area where all the water will flow to the same point. Uh, so if it rains up near Lake James up here, it's my cursor, maybe, yes. Um, or if it rains over here in uh, Mooresville, if it rains in Lancaster, um, or in Chester, or really you know, anywhere within this kind of green line, all that water is eventually going to either evaporate, transpirate, or flow uh, to the confluence of the Water River and the Congaree River. Uh, so this is a big area, 5,000 square miles. There's about 9,000 linear feet of perennial streams. Uh, so it's a lot of streams uh, to cover. Um, and this uh, basin is not what we can consider like a, a natural basin. Um, it's been heavily engineered. We have 11 reservoirs, 14 dams. Um, and those are really the kind of the central source of both electricity and drinking water for our municipalities. We have about, actually it's up to 3 million people now with the new census. Uh, so this is kind of just a, a larger picture. So the Catawba River Basin uh, is part of the larger Santee River Basin. Uh, so that's, again, kind of flows out there. It's not exactly on this map, but there's also that diversion uh, to the Cooper River. Uh, so all this water, again, will eventually go out into the ocean, either on the Santee or the Cooper out in the Charleston. Uh, when I said it was heavily engineered, I mean, it's really heavily engineered. About 85% of the total drop uh, from Lake James down to Lake Watery is captured within those reservoirs. So when we say a river, it's really just a controlled release through this engineered system. Uh, there is about a nine mile section, a beautiful trout fishing area below Lake James in the Bridgewater section. And then you guys, of course, have the best section of the Catawba River, uh, which is that 26 mile section from the Wiley Dam down to Fishing Creek Reservoir. So that is the longest undammed section of the Catawba. And obviously the reservation is there, Lansford Canal State Park is there, the largest colony of Arkansas spirulays. It's a pretty big deal. It's also been designated as scenic blue way by the state of South Carolina. Uh, and then again, the rest of that's kind of captured within those reservoir systems. So our organization uh, went through strategic planning last year and we kind of identified four kind of big areas where we think we can push the needle. So again, there's a large area to work under and there are a lot of different water quality problems. Um, but last year we identified kind of the, the areas we thought we could make have the most impact as MPDS permits, stormwater, uh, concentrated animal feeding operations and uh, recreational bacteria. Uh, so for those of you that don't live in the, the Clean Water Act jargon, uh, MPDS or NIPDES, that's the National Pollution Discharge Elimination System. So if I'm an industry or a wastewater plant or any other type of facility that has liquid waste, and I want to discharge that waste uh, back into uh, waters of the United States or any like, perennial water that you see out there, um, I have to have a permit to do that. So this permitting system was created in the Clean Water Act at the end of the 70s. Um, and there are currently about 340 or so permitted discharges uh, into the Cabo Basin. About half of those are wastewater plants, and those are big, gigantic ones, like the Charlotte one, which is about 70 million gallons of uh, liquid per day, uh, to very small packaging plants that you might have at like a trailer park. It's only going to be given out, you know, maybe 20,000 gallons a day or something like that. Each of those has a permit, and each of those has slightly different requirements. Those permits then expire every five years, um, and then that's an opportunity for the public to comment, say, hey, should they be permitted to discharge this much? What kind of monitoring should they have to do? What kind of reporting should be allowed? Um, and most of you have probably never heard of that system. I probably don't know anything about those permits um, because they're not very well publicized. And so that's something our organization works to review those permits, to look at the monitoring, look at the enforcement, uh, and to make sure that as those come up every five years, that uh, they're actually getting better. That's the point of the pollution discharge elimination system. So the goal is every five years, this permits get ratcheted down a little bit um, and eventually you know, we won't be discharging waste into water, hopefully. Next one's kind of our, our biggest issue is the stormwater. And so anything that doesn't come in uh, through a designated pipe that runs in, this runoff, um, that's what we mean by stormwater. And so that's things like litter and, and balls that, that fall in all, into the water. 
Um, but it's also other things like uh, animal waste that comes off of fields or human waste in some cases. Um, it can be a lot of different things. We have all kinds of different runoff coming in there we get a large storm system. Uh, the next one are these concentrated animal feeding operations. So this isn't like your friend with a couple of chickens or that guy you know that's got like 15 cows. Um, these are large industrial operations. So at least 30,000 chickens or at least 100 head of cattle within a confined area. Um, so this is really more of a North Carolina problem. South Carolina actually has pretty good laws on this and pretty good monitoring. North Carolina does not. And so I'll kind of briefly mention that later. And then finally, uh, our most popular monitoring program is Swim Guide. And so people often ask us, hey, is it safe to swim? Um, and that's actually kind of a hard question to answer. The states, uh, while they do monitor for bacteria, um, there's a delay from when they monitor to when that becomes public. In North Carolina, uh, it's really bad. It's about 18 months. South Carolina, not as bad. It's only about two months usually. Um, but still, that doesn't really help you if you want to go swimming this weekend. Uh, so you can look at the historical record, but you really won't know exactly what's in the water at that time. Uh, so we have a, a weekly monitoring program that we run. We had 58 sites this summer, including ones on the main stem of the Catawba, as well as in all the major reservoirs and on Rocky Creek uh, down here in Fort Lawn. Uh, so those are kind of our, our big primary areas. Now that's not to say that's like the only things we do. There's still a lot of other water quality issues. There's still coal ash, there's tons of active construction. We're gonna have another drought. There's also flooding. There's also fun new chemicals of emergent concern. Uh, PFAS are kind of the most, uh, one to hear about in the news right now. Um, there's harmful algal blooms. May you knows anybody on Lake Wiley, we have an algal bloom there right now. Um, there's dam removal projects that we're working on. There's coal tar sealants. There's lots of other issues uh, that we are part of, uh, but we also heavily rely on other partners, such as the Southern Environmental Law Center, American Rivers, uh, Conservation Networks, and other municipalities to help us address those. So this is just kind of a map of all those permits I was talking about. Uh, so you can see the, uh, the brown ones there, those are the wastewater ones, the red ones are industry. Uh, and these are generally going to be clustered around the larger stems, and they're going to be clustered around um, people. So in areas where we have lots of people, we usually have a lot of pollution, both from industry and wastewater. Uh, stormwater, again, same kind of impact, where this is usually worse in the urban areas. Uh, so in Charlotte, Rock Hill, your heavily um, developed areas, that's where we're going to see a lot of the stormwater. And that's, again, because of all the impervious surface. So if you've got like an acre of forest and it rains an inch, here in the southeast, you're not going to have much runoff. I mean, ideally, most of that's going to be intercepted by the canopy or it's going to go into the ground. You really won't see hardly anything running off the site. That same acre of parking lot is going to generate almost 30,000 gallons of water. So we get a lot of runoff in our urban areas. Um, and it's getting worse. You might have noticed uh, people like to live around here. People are, are moving from all over the country to the southeast, particularly in the Charlotte Rock Hill area. We see the greatest development there. Uh, but Lancaster is also growing. Um, and uh, we're getting a lot of growth. And with that comes a lot more construction and people and runoff. Uh, this can lead to stream incision. Uh, so when you have more water going into the channel than was, that water has more power. And so we'll start to erode the banks. And so that causes kind of two problems. One, we're getting a bunch of dirt and pollutants into our reservoirs where our drinking water comes from. Uh, but also that erosion will now separate the stream from the floodplain. So it creates this fun feedback cycle where it would have previously come out of its banks and kind of spilled over. Now it can't do that because it keeps digging itself down and it just keeps going until it hits bedrock. So this is kind of the scene that we'll see after a rainstorm. Um, actually, the, the main channel is pretty well protected. We have at least a 50 foot buffer in place. There's much less development going on on the main reservoirs and on the actual uh, main stem of the Catawba. The issue is now is really in the tributaries. It's much harder to address. So we have a couple programs to do with this. Um, one of them is me going meeting with county and state officials to try and up our stormwater protections. Uh, that's a very slow process, you might imagine. Um, but we have a couple other programs and probably the, the one that people know best is, is our trash cleanups. And so those are volunteer events, but we've also started now uh, to put in these passive collection systems called litter getters. And so we've got a couple of these. Uh, this one's in Charlotte. We've also got one at the Ann Springs Coast Greenway. And so as uh, floating plastic and trash comes down, it gets captured in these devices and then we remove it from there. And these will catch about a thousand pounds of trash per year. 
North Carolina has recently um, digitized their construction sites, which is awesome. I'm hoping that South Carolina is going to catch up. Uh, but this is also another opportunity for us to kind of monitor that stormwater. So this is really where we focus our water watcher training. We're trying to point them out to these active construction sites. They can make sure that they're following all the proper stormwater compliances, like having the silt fence up, I'm not clearing too much land at one time, things like that. Um, but we do have a, a lot of active construction going on. It's harder to find in South Carolina. And just again, those CAFOs, um, these are, are really frustrating in North Carolina. They have what's called a, a deemed permitted policy. And so there's actually no map of where the facilities are for dry layer poultry. Um, we know that there's roughly 50 million birds uh, based on the agricultural census, um, but we don't exactly know where those are in North Carolina um, or where their waste is being spread or when it's being spread. However, when we do go out in those areas and we collect water samples, we find very high levels of fecal bacteria, nitrogen, and, and phosphorus. I think it's kind of too much of a good thing. Your know, chicken litter can be an amazing soil amendment spread at the proper time and the proper amounts. It's, it's great. Um, unfortunately, when you're packing in all these birds into one spot, um, there's just not enough land in those areas to properly split, spread it out. South Carolina actually does have a fantastic permitting system, so I can tell you exactly how many birds there are, uh, where their waste is being spread, when it was being spread, and what their waste utilization plan actually is. So feel good about that down here. North Carolina, these are all the permitted facilities. So there's like 18 cattle operations or something. You guys have about 20 of these poultry operations in South Carolina, one hog farm, I think three dairy, not too much. Um, but then North Carolina, the big issue are, are the chickens. And so when you kind of zoom in, it looks like this. So you get a lot of chickens on the streams. Um, and then again, that flows into those reservoirs. And so this is kind of the upper Catawba, um, right there above uh, Lookout Shoals, Lake Hickory, that area. That's where we see the, the biggest problem. And this is again kind of what it looks like. So that big kind of dark pile right there, that's chicken litter. And so that's a combination of chicken excrement, feathers, uh, and then the bedding. And usually the chickens will they'll have three or four flocks on that before they actually push it out. Uh, so, and they'll, they can just leave it out there for up to 15 days. And like, I mean, there's like a house for like scale, like it's a massive, massive amounts of waste. And again, again, swim bed, again, that's our recreation program. We just wrapped that up. We collected roughly 200 samples this summer um, at 50 something, sorry, not 200, 2000 samples this summer um, at all the different sites. And so that's our, our recreational uh, monitoring program. So if you're interested in learning whether or not the spot that you go to is safe enough to swim, you can always check out either our app, the swim guide app, um, or the website or our social media that was updated every week this summer. We had about 70,000 views on that information. So people are looking at it. Uh, the most popular spot was the Wiley Dam release uh, where like all the tubers hop in. That's like the most popular spot. A couple thousand people um, would launch there every week and we'd have a couple hundred check our stats. That kind of brings me to the, the last kind of big important thing here is, you know, we again have a staff of like 10. It's a really big area. And there's a lot of issues. So we heavily rely on individuals and volunteers to help not just with the cleanups, but also with finding things, telling us, hey, I think there's a spill here. Hey, this doesn't smell right. Or, you know, I was looking at the city council and there's something about water on it. You know, we really rely on individuals to help us out. Uh, and one great way they can do that is with our new Catawba Riverkeeper app. And so that has a pollution reporter. Um, it also has that basin map, which is going to show you where all those industrial permits are on it. It also has the recreational access sites. It's got the release schedule for the dams. Um, so I would encourage anybody that's interested in more information, use it to download that app. It's free, of course. Um, it's got a lot of good stuff on it. So how do we decide what we're going to work with? How do we decide that we're most interested in CAFOs and NPDES and bacteria, et cetera? Um, we do this through our, our kind of strategic planning and through what we call the State of the River Report. So this was something that our board and our members challenged us to start last year. They really want to make sure that we're using our very limited resources in the most efficient manner. Really make sure, like, how do we decide should we go after chickens farms or you know should we explore PFAS testing? You know, unfortunately, we don't have all the resources to do everything. And so the challenge is to create a rubric uh, to kind of prioritize what we're most interested in and what's going to have the biggest impact on water quality, water quantity, 
uh, for current and future generations. And so, you know, we collect data, but then the states collect data, and then Duke collects data, and then the tribe collects data, and there's all these sources of data out there, and they're not always consolidated. Everybody's kind of generating their own reports. So one thing we like to do once a year is make sure that we're downloading everybody's data, kind of putting it into one spot. Um, the same thing is we want to create kind of a new rubric. You know, there is the national rubric, and that's the 303D list, if you ever heard like an impaired stream. Um, but we want something to really be more fine-grained and to also include some of those more subjective and narrative characteristics, like how easy is, is it to get on the water, so particularly if you don't have a boat, or how easy is it, or sorry, are, are, how many inspectors are there out there? How easy is it to contact those inspectors? Um, is the monitoring information that is out there, is it easy to access? Is it machine-readable? Can you use it to function like that? So, we wanted to, to include the entire basin. Um, so geographically, we are covering in this report all the different areas, um, but we didn't want to include all the data from all time because that's a lot. And it's not going to tell you much, and I honestly can't do all that. You know, I'm not a statistician. So um, we are only including the most recent year of data. Now, in some cases, that is actually the most recent calendar year for things like sewer overflows. Um, or for water quality in North Carolina, it's an 18 month delay <laughs> on the most recent data. Um, so, you know, there is a little bit of, you know, this doesn't quite line up for each one, but we're being consistent in that we're trying to pull whatever's most available to us. And we're trying to use that and all this information to come up with some underlying scores so that we can better talk to the public about it. I mean, there's all kinds of different ways to measure water quality. You can measure it you know, in the chemistry, you can measure it like the, the physical parameters, how much of it there is, what temperatures, things like that. Um, and then there's also a lot of biological indicators. So things like, you know, are there invasive species there? Is there the right uh, amount of fish, the right different types of fish, are there viruses for there, things like that. And so we want to kind of take all this information and distill it down into simpler terms. Uh, we ended up first kind of divvying up the basin. You know, it's not exactly useful to compare the water quality of like trout streams in the Linville Gorge, you know, protected wilderness to like what's coming out of Charlotte. You know, we want to at least to kind of split up a little bit. Uh, so we broke it down into five sub basins. And so the Northern Basin is everything that flows in uh, to Lookout Shoals Lake. Uh, the South Fork Basin is everything that flows in to the South Fork. Uh, the Central Catawba Basin, is everything that flows into uh, Lake Norman, Mountain Island Lake, and Lake Wiley. Uh, the Southern Catawba Basin, where we are now, is everything that flows in after Wiley and then eventually flows into Fishing Creek Lake. And then the Watery Basin, which is everything that comes in after the Watery Dam but before Congaree National Park. Then within each of those, uh, we'll get five kind of categories. So one is monitoring. Is there good information available? How recent is it? Is it accessible? Uh, point source pollution, so how many facilities are there discharging waste? Are they up to code? Are they up to compliance? Um, uh, are they being inspected? Non-point source pollution, how much impervious surface is in the watershed? Uh, how many active construction sites are there? Um, what do the turbidity numbers look like after a rainstorm? Uh, water quantity, uh, is there droughts? Uh, is there flooding? Um, is, there, um, is the water uh, being are we overutilizing the water uh, for drinking water or for industry? Um, and then finally, recreation. And so can you eat the fish? Or is it easy to get on the water? Is it easy to find out information about that? And then within each of those, we use that very simple light dart scale, you know, very poor, poor, fair, good, excellent. So our kind of one to five scale. So I'm not going to go into all this. There's a whole like 30 page report where you can read all about every individual basin, but I'll just say that the Northern Basin, it's, it's got the highest score, which is not surprising because they're upstream of everybody else. So they just have their own pollution to worry about. And also about 40% of that land is actually protected through the Pisgah Forest System, the Nantahala Forest System, um, and a couple other state parks as well. Actually, sorry, Nantahala is just to the west of that. Uh, the biggest issue up there was the, the non-point source pollution and the monitoring, which is not that much being done. In the central Catawba, uh, which kind of flows in right above us here, um, there were some, some big issues up there, primarily non-point source pollution. You know, that's where we see the greatest amount of development. Everything along the I-77 corridor is really just blowing up. Mooresville, Davidson, Cornelius, kind of think of those towns as well as the, the northern part of Charlotte. A lot, a lot of growth there. And even in the southern part of Gaston County, we've seen a lot of growth. 
Um, and the checks on that and the monitoring have, have not really kept up. So kind of the biggest issues over there, again, non point source pollution. We've also seen an active degradation of some of those standards by the North Carolina legislature. Not so much down here. So feel, again, feel kind of good about that. Um, but North Carolina, really, they just, they're trying to, to make it a lot harder uh, for, means, for municipalities to clean up their own water, uh, which is very frustrating. Uh, the South Fork Basin, this is a, a really kind of a, a gem of a section. If you've ever been to South Mountain State Park, that's the headwaters there. Uh, it flows kind of through Lincolnton. They've got, again, ag and, and non point source pollution. They've also got a lot of historical land use issues. Um, and then there's, it's very difficult to access the water. Um, so those were kind of the, the big pushes there. Uh, the Southern Catawba Basin, where we're sitting right now, um, this is really kind of a mixed bag. You know, I, I think in the future we might split this one again um, because this does include most of Charlotte. Um, most of Charlotte comes in through Sugar Creek, um, which if you've ever been out near Sugar Creek after it's rained, it is terrible. Huge amounts of trash and sediment, um, bacteria. It is, it's quite bad. So the Catawba River from the Wiley Dam down to Sugar Creek, awesome. Like crystal clear, like almost all the time. And then as soon as Sugar Creek comes in, it really, really degrades the whole system. So uh, that is, again, because Charlotte is very paved, it's very old. A lot of Charlotte was built up before these clean water regulations were in place. Um, but then the, you've also got some other types of land use issues uh, coming down. We have a lot of, of legacy phosphorus, which has contributed to issues on Lake Watery, things like that. Um, I will say this part of the basin has the best monitoring between the work that Charlotte does and the work that DHEC does. Um, you can find real-time data on almost everything. It's, it's quite impressive. It's by far the best monitoring anywhere in the basin. Um, unfortunately, that data often just sits there and there's not a lot being done with it. It's not exactly directing policy. And so that is kind of an issue that we're pushing for. Um, and if you don't have your own boat, it can be challenging in some areas to get to have access to the river. Some of these spots are really spread out. There's not a lot of information about it. Uh, so we're excited for, excited for some of the upcoming recreational improvements, um, like the Great Falls project, um, but there's a couple other ones coming along, particularly in York County. Uh, finally, the Watery Basin, if you've ever been down there, it's a giant swamp. Um, but it was, it was crazy. We paddled it this past year. We did a 75-mile, three-day paddle through this uh, section, and it was pouring rain, and every creek that came in was crystal clear. And I've not experienced that really anywhere else in the basin. And it's because um, it's just so swampy around there that there's not a lot of development and you can't really develop down there. A lot of it's now been protected as well. And so the uh, non-point source pollution, there's just much less of it there anywhere else. And obviously there's a lot of water. Um, you still have coal-fired power plant, you still have paper mill, you still have some uh, kind of big industrial users, uh, but it is a really beautiful section if you can figure out a way to get to it. Um, there's not a lot of uh, access to it. In one section, there's a 30 mile paddle between two points and there's no information about where to camp. So you really kind of have to kind of put yourself out there. It can be a little bit sketchy. So kind of the big takeaways from this across the basin, really, you see that nine point source pollution is the biggest issue and that's not that surprising, right? And it's pretty easy uh, to spend more money collecting more data or to spend more money getting a couple of different industries and big pipes uh, to kind of ratchet down their pollution. Uh, but non-point source pollution is that, that death by a thousand cuts. It's a little bit from everybody. It's broke dust off your car, it's tires off here, it's a wrapper, somebody dropped. Um, and it really does add up, particularly uh, when we see our storms becoming less frequent and heavier. All right, I just cruised through a ton of information, um, but I did want to leave some time uh, for questions, and I'm sure that you don't actually want me to talk for an entire hour. Um, so I welcome any questions and discussion. Thank you for your time.